Mm -hmm. You did it. Very good. Okay, Jolene, it's all yours. Right. Would someone open us in prayer, please? Mm -hmm. I can. Dear God, we thank you for everyone gathered here today and ask that you surround us with your powerful life-changing presence. Thank you for loving each of us and for calling us to walk with you. We come before you as we meet and declare our dependence on you. Be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Fill our hearts with your love. Fill our words and our conversations with truth and grace. We ask all of these things in praise and adoration of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Viv. That was beautiful. Viv, that was. Well, I'm going to be revised standard version. And my verse is 2 Peter 3.16. And it says, speaking of this, as he does in all his letters, there are things in them hard to understand, which an twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Peter claims to have been written by the age Apostle Peter as he sensed the end of his life was drawing near. A sense of urgency had come over him knowing that his time was short. The problems facing his beloved fellow believers were great and increasing and he had just one more opportunity to fulfill the commission given to him by his Lord nearly 40 years earlier. As time passed, Peter observed that not only did Christians experience an increase in external pressures, but the problems resulting from the continuing presence of sin were not fading away. Peter knew that until Christ returned or took him home to glory, the struggle against internal sin individually and corporately would continue. Would someone please read 2 Peter 1, 13 through 15, please? I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Thank you, Deborah. Can anyone add any more about Peter in his life and his um, epistle? Marlene, anybody? <laughs> I have to get unmuted. Peter? is the foundation of the church. Uh, if you remember in Matthew 16, chapter 16 verses, uh, sorry, I can't remember, uh, 17, 18, something like that. Jesus hands Peter the keys to the church. 16, that chapter 16. says, you are the rock. And remember, Peter means rock. You are the rock on which I'll build my church. And basically says, Peter, those you approve of will be part of the church. So Peter, besides being an apostle and writing this, um, according as found in Matthew, was chosen by Jesus to be the founder of the church. And Barbara has told us that the Catholics recognized him and can, some of them at least consider him the first Pope, the well, first can... leader of the Catholic church. I love you, Marlene, thank you. Mm -hmm. The letter is a reminder of the truth of the gospel against pernicious attack of false teachers who were bringing in destructive hearsays. The false teachers were corrupt and immoral. Would someone please read 2 Peter 2, verses 2, 3, and 10. 
<clears throat> Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. Did you say four? Uh, ten. Uh, ten. I'm sorry. To ten, all the way to ten, I'm sorry. For if God did not spare no, no, no. any. Did you want her to read all the way to ten or just ten? Ten, two, three, and ten. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's two and three. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's pretty powerful. <laughs> In their teachings, they were scoffing at the belief in the Lord's return. If someone would read 2 Peter 3, 3 through 10. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. Thank you. Peter reminds his readers that the Lord will keep his promises. Therefore, they are warned to keep themselves spotless and pure. Second Peter 3.14 reads, hmm. For, beloved, since you wait for these, be zealous to be found by him without spot and blemish, and stay at peace. Is there any comments so far about this? Or anything anyone can add about the false teachings? Hmm. Well, I wanted to say something way back when, when somebody was reading um, uh, 2 Peter 1, 15, where it says, um, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things and it makes me so thankful for the Holy Spirit because back in John, he says, I will send another to you, will help you remember everything that I teach you. Um, thank the Lord, right? So I think that's real critical to, to have the Holy Spirit help us remember the teachings of Jesus so that we can appropriately address those who have the false teachings and the slander and that sort of thing. Yes. I think the Holy Spirit is the whole key to that, that we can decipher the, the false teachings and the real ones. Right. Oh, I think that's... Is there any other comments? I think, I think that we also need to be aware that the false teachings are just as prevalent, if not more so now. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, it's very easy, and you all have heard me harp on this many times, but it's very easy, much easier sometimes to go and pick up a commentary um, because we're having trouble figuring out exactly what a certain passage or something means and forgetting that they're called commentaries for a reason. There's just somebody's opinion. And we, uh, we have to be very careful to make sure that that opinion is the same as what's in the Bible. You know, it's interesting you say that, Marlene, because um, there's a, an online pastor that I listen to a lot. And he said one thing about the, he was talking about the commentaries and that sort of thing. And he said, you know, he purposefully all his life sought out Bibles that had no commentary even at the bottom mm -hmm. because he felt the Lord wanted him to search the word itself to find the answers. Of course, he was that was his living. Most of us don't have all that time to do that, but we do have to devote, devote enough time. And commentaries help me, but Marlene, you've helped me immensely by saying 
over and over just what you did. Don't believe the commentaries, read them and then research them and verify. The Bible always explains the Bible. Right. That's very important. Okay. Anything else? All right. God will punish the wicked. Would someone please read 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6. For if God did not spare angels, when of that time was deluged and destroyed, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment, and destruction of the ungodly men. I'm sorry, did I go too far? No. Where'd you, where'd you want me to read through? <laughs> uh, six. Six through four through six. Oh, I went through seven. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. That was, it all went together. <laughs> <laughs> God delays his punishment in order that men may repent. But the day will come where he will destroy the whole universe and then there will be the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The apostle Peter declared a fundamental precept of the Christian faith in this verse. He asserted that a distorted understanding of scripture caused by ignorance and instability will lead to personal destruction that begins on the inside and works out through immorality and devastates churches. He did so in the context of discussing personal holiness and thereby established fundamental unity with the apostle Paul, stating that Paul and he agreed on these matters. But Peter went further to claim that Paul's writings and by association his own writings stood on par with the Old Testament as the inspired and errant word of God. The early church received the writings of Paul, Peter, and the entire Old Testament as the authoritative word of God. Tragically, even in the early church, there had already appeared a phenomenon that is still with us to this day. This is the fundamental intellectual error of our time known as postmodernism in which everyone gets to decide for himself what is true and that the original intent of the author is subject to what I want it to mean. When I read that, that describes, I feel like, what we're living with right now, 100%. What is mm -hmm. y'all's that? I agree. I agree mm -hmm. with you 100%. I, I think it's kind of like everybody has their own opinion and my opinion is right and if you disagree with my opinion then you're wrong we and i i think they make the scriptures fit what they want to believe not what god meant or what the author meant i think they try to bring worldly things into the bible that were not intended to be there yes Marlene, you're on mute. You're on mute. I also think we all have a problem in that. We want the answer and we want the answer now. And there's a lot that God doesn't want us to know now that will only be revealed when we go to heaven. And that's hard for most of us to accept because we wanna know everything now. And if we can't find it in the Bible, well, okay, we'll go someplace else and look for it. And I think we're kind of all guilty of that. Yeah. Some much a, more than others. A test of our faith. Yes to just accept and say, God, you are in control. Yeah. Is there any more input from anyone? 
That was good, Marlene. Thank you. All right. The Holy Spirit writing through Peter gives us seven weapons for waging battle within ourselves and our fellowship. One is to continue spiritual gro growth is foundation to all else. In 2 Peter verse 1, 8 says we may have the qual qualities, but they must continue to increase throughout all of our life. Well, I think Bible study is the one way we increase our quality of spiritual growth. And all the different programs that Rejoice Lutheran offers is just a growing experience, I think. Anyone's thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, as some of you may know, I am uh, going to be moving out of state here pretty soon. And one of the things I'm going to miss most about having lived in this area is my Rejoice Church family and all of the wonderful opportunities to serve the Lord through different programs and, and pathways through Rejoice, like Many Helping Hands and the um, Arrow Outreach Scholarship Program, um, through the quilting and uh, prime timers. So it, this is going to be a, a major life change. And I think, you know, what we're doing right now is that we're, we're putting putting God in the center of all of this. We're going to be closer to family, even though we'll be separated from our church family. And uh, we, we will still be able to Zoom for worship, um, be connected through the, uh, the Bible study here on Wednesday mornings. So, you know, God works miracles and, and keeps us strong and healthy in our faith as long as we remember to put him first. And certainly, you know, Peter put Christ first um, when he, even though he did deny him three times as, as Jesus had told him he would do, he still, he still just wept bitterly and came back and, and said, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. And he was committed and faithful to, to serving Christ even after his death. So we, we need to keep God first and, and focus on Christ, just as Peter did. Well, Lord, B, you were the one that came to mind because you do so much. You're, you're just a saint to me for all the giving things that you do. You are just selfless. And uh, well, Jolene, I'm going to just jump in here just real quickly. I have to tell you, the reason I was late signing on this morning was I was having the most lovely conversation with Jocelyn. <laughs> and, um, and, and the, the purpose in calling her was, you know, primarily to just ask that she include the, the families and loved ones of the Uvalde uh, murders in Texas yesterday. And, you know, and our, our prayers of the church for Sunday and, and just kind of update her on, on, our leaving status here. So I apologize so much for being late signing in this morning, ladies, but um, here I am <laughs> one more time before, before we move. I, I won't be signing in next week. So um, mm -hmm. Jolene, you're doing a great job and I'm sorry I've, I've interrupted your... your oh. um... oh, <laughs> now, I love your input and, and you were the, like I said, the one that really came to mind because you do so much. And it, it's very, you know, your spiritual growth, it shows, Laura B. It just is outpouring in you. Is there any other input? Um, yeah, God didn't put us on this earth to sit on our butts and watch soaps and eat bonbons all day. <laughs> no. I have something. I was sitting here looking at the screen and listening to you, Laura, and we will miss you desperately being here in person. But thank the Lord, we have Zoom. And 
our lesson is by being given right now by somebody in Colorado. Kathy is listening in. I assume you're in Mississippi, Kathy, yes. right? Right. Um, Laura, when she moves, will be in Ohio. And how blessed we are. Three years ago, if you said uh, Zoom, I'd have gone, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think all back to the problems we had at the beginning, just getting signed on because we didn't know what we were doing. And here we are, there's what, uh, three, six, nine, 12 of us here today and spread around the United States. And what miracles God works and how he provides that we can be together, even on screen to share the blessings of each other. And Laura, well, as I said, we'll miss you desperately in person, but thank the Lord, we'll still be able to meet with you weekly. Yes. Can't get, a, can't get rid of my ugly mug too easily now, can we? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else before we move on? All right, the next one um, that they give us as waging battle within ourselves and our fellowship is that life is short and there is no time to waste. The cause of reaching the world for Christ and growing in his likeness. Well, again, Laura B., I thought of you. <laughs> you do some, well, the whole church does and everyone does. I, I think that's why I just love Rejoice Lutheran. I've never been in a church that is, does such outreach and stewardship and so much for um, to show the world of Christ. And I, I, I'm just very glad to be a part of that. And I think we just have to remember life. Is there any other input on that one? I think you at Rejoice are so blessed that you have the resources to do all the things that you do. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm at a little bitty Lutheran church that I love dearly with all my heart, but we are a poor church. We are demographically, we have no young people. We are at the point now where we are a bunch of nice old people, sweet old people, and we we are committed to the things that we do, but we don't have resources, but we have vast outreach. Um, we have vast sharing the word. We can't do anything like this, but it's just, I'm so, so lucky, so blessed to to be a part of this. Y'all are y'all are just amazing. I feel blessed too, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I do. All right, number three. I'm sorry, Jolene. I'm sorry, oh. I was on mute, so I had to. I, oh. I want to say we who are physically and rejoice are blessed by all of you. Because mm -hmm. you even though you're not here, again, I'll use the word physically, you all add so much to our meetings and our thoughts. And Jolene, you came in, you worked pumpkin patch. Oh, and I, oh, and Pam, your ministry on that is <laughs> forever. That was one of the funnest things. I love that. I yeah. loved you working. I loved you. Thank you. <laughs> I loved meeting you. It'll always be in my heart, Kim. <laughs> I think, you know, God, I firmly believe God puts each of us where we are at a certain time for a certain purpose. And um, 
We may not know what it is. We may not realize what it was for five or 10 years, but if our hearts are open, he's working within us and he's certainly working within this group. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Every. Is there any other comments? <clears throat> All right, number three, the necessity of first and firsthand experience with God. We may not have a mountaintop experience as Peter, but we must encounter God through his book and the writings of men moved by the Holy Spirit. Marlene, you came to mind on this one because you're always telling us to dive into his word. And I love that. And uh, I think that that's, that really keeps me connected and more so than ever, diving into the word, reading his word and doing the Bible study. I mean, everything. What are y'all's comments on that? Well, it's like my sister said the other day, I told her, well, I don't have anything to work on. Um, you know, I was working on Mary for a while, and then I worked on the 316. And that's a lot of work. But still, when I didn't have anything to work on, I missed it. I missed not doing that research. And Jane says, Oh, you're hungry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> True. Well, I think I think I think that um, preparing a lesson and presenting a lesson, of course, you're going to learn so much more because, like you said, Jolene, you dig deep, right? Yeah. And then it's—I mean, it's—it's it's just so intriguing. You just. The more you read, the more you want. And that's where Kathy's at. And I think, you know, I think that's one of the beauties of uh, preparing a lesson. Because it really gets you digging deep and gets you thinking about the Lord in a lot of ways. Laura, your hand is up. Yeah. Um, it, it's like a treasure hunt on it Wednesday is. mornings. It and, and listening to to my dear sisters in this Bible study group and getting the, the feedback and the input of, of thoughts and, and queries that, you know, get you going further and deeper into your own faith has just been such a blessing in my life. And mm -hmm. I love you all and thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there any, anyone else? All right, number four, the certitude of false teachers. They imitate the real thing. And we talked about this earlier that the Holy Spirit helps help us discern what is real and what's not. And I think that's so important right now. Does anyone have any more on that one? Um, you know me, I can't keep my mouth shut. I know, it's in, I know it's in James and I'm turning pages because I can't remember the chapter in the verse. Uh, hopefully Maggie will cover up when she's in there. But in the book of James, and I'm going to be paraphrasing because I don't know exactly where. Um, oh, here. Chapter, uh, you know, I, well, Second Peter is talking about false teachers. But James says, false teachers, and as I said, I'm paraphrasing, will be more harshly punished because what you're teaching is a falsehood that you have to be careful. And that puts us right back to, okay, if you're teaching, where do you get your information from? The Bible. You know, Marlene, to that, to that point, false teachers, when someone knowingly teaches something false, obviously that's the huge sin and that's where they will be judged really harshly. What about the person who unknowingly teaches or speaks falsely because they think they have it. They think I've got an understanding of this and they truly mean good in their heart but maybe they're wrong in their understanding. 
And, you know, so they're telling what they believe to be right, they think in their own mind, but it could be false, unintentionally false. You said, does that make sense? The, the poor person who, who, you know, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, <laughs> uh, saying sometimes. Well, where, do, where does it come from, what they're saying? Where does it come from? Well, if they're reading the Bible and they're doing their own, interp they're, they're interpreting it as they think it means, and they've done what they think, they, they have researched it as much as they can, but what if they still come to the wrong conclusion, innocently come to the wrong conclusion? Because sometimes there's some things in the Bible that are very complex, right? And maybe they don't have a resource like these wonderful women on this call, or they're not connected to a church and they're trying to do this on their own. I know they, people should be praying for understanding, but, and we do, because we know to do that, but not everybody knows all that stuff. So. Well, Jean, I've always been taught through the years that when I'm talking about something coming from the Bible and say, I read you a verse, that, and I'm going on to explain it, that I should always say, now this is my opinion. Or in my opinion, this verse six means such and such. Right, of course, all of us on this call would do that. I just think about the person that's more isolated and doesn't have as much experience in the, in the word. Then they should I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to harp on it, but I'm just going to say that, I, that there's some people that may be innocently saying something incorrectly, um, unknowingly following Christ, what they're doing. Yeah, following Christ means that you are in a community of believers. You cannot be a Christian by yourself, isolated. That's not what Jesus intended for us. He, he said, go ye into the world and preach my gospel of peace. So you have to be in the world. You have to be part of the community. You can't just be sitting at home, you know, watching a televangelist and a light bulb come on that, that may be, you know, swayed by the opinion of the televangelist right. is not of really course. from God, you know? Of Does course, that and that's sense? a good point. And that's a good point. I agree with that too. I guess what it says to me more than anything else, it talks about outreach to people because some people are, they may live way out in the country in the boondoggles, you know? Uh, they may not be in a, in, a, in a neighborhood or in a community to be able to have that interaction. And that's where, I guess, that's where you go on outreach to others to try and help spread the word the way the word should be. Anyway, I just think about people that so, think they've got it when they're a little confused still. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But if you're a teacher, you're in a group. Mm -hmm. You're obviously in a group. You have people that are students of, of Christ and of the word. And so you're not alone there. I mean, obviously, if you're a teacher, you're not cut off from everything and trying to do stuff on your own. You are in a group of, of learners and uh, people that study the word. So I don't know. I, I have to say, just jump in here really quickly. There has, has been some very disturbing news um, just within the last few days concerning the Southern Baptist Convention. And I was raised Baptist, was baptized in the Baptist church um, but it has come to light that there has been sexual abuse by people higher up in the Southern Baptist Convention. So when it talks about false teachers and their destruction, you know, someone who abuses their power in the church like that is definitely um, on God's naughty list. <laughs> Um, now that's and that's knowingly doing it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, television has been around for a long time now, and there have been um, televangelists way before Zoom. A lot of people who have been isolated, speaking to Jane's point, they, they watch, you know, Sunday morning, they might watch um, Joel Osteen 
or there's um there's just a whole bunch jimmy swagger comes to mind and all these different ministers on the television and oh you can get your miracle water too don't forget that uh, <laughs> see commercials for that all the time but you know it's, fool me once shame on me shame on you fool me twice shame on me right yes um so it, it's not always with god's intention that these people are out there um preaching on the television a lot of them are but some of them have you know more personal or or uh, uh greedy motives if you will yeah mm -hmm. I think also we have to remember, and by the way, there's a, he's Korean and it's right, he's right over here off of uh, 112. And he tells the people if they bring him like $10,000, uh -huh, he will basically cure everything that's wrong with him. And wow, people are doing it. I've driven by the church and they meet on, a, on Saturday as one of their, and the people are lined up out the door. But uh, the thing I was going to say is you have to pray. And you have to pray sincerely that God will open your heart and teach you what is right and wrong. And that your heart will be open and receive his word. And if it is, and if you're not trying to tell him what to do, because so many of us ask for help and then try to do it ourselves, he'll teach you and lead you in the right way, even if you're hearing incorrect information. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does, right? And the right. Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' teachings. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and that's what my next one was. Wholesome thinking in scripture, reading and memory. So that goes right with that. I think wholesome thinking, you know, you have to control what you think, say and do at all times. And then I think that all goes back to scripture, reading and memory. It all combines into one. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I think that's where daily devotional, when you start your day in the word, where you start your day in prayer, and then throughout the day, um, if you're praying with those around you, um, I think that keeps you in a posture that's right living. Yes. And the Bible has it all through there about the importance of knowledge. And we gain our knowledge by, like Deborah says, staying in the word, reading the word, studying the word, discussing the word, praying. Um, it all brings to knowledge, which is invaluable. Oh, yeah. And I'll remind all of you again, my own personal masuza. get in your car. And if you get in your car 25 times a day, do it 25 times a day. Get in your car, back it out of your garage, and push your garage door closer button. And while it is going down, sit there and pray. Ask God to guide you, to give you the words to say, the things to do that will bring glory to him, and then whatever else. But do it every time i do thank you that's nice and that's as i said don't just do it when you go out in the morning if you go out more than once a day do it more than once a day. i also ask him to bring me home safely each time <laughs> well, God protect me on the road yes yes <laughs> but that you know god doesn't care if you're Prayer is a two-hour dissertation. A simple, heartfelt, thank you, God. Or something like that each morning. And I have told young mothers this, who are frantically trying to get their kids off to school. And, you know, it's been a morning of our lost clothes and everything. And I said, take that time while your garage door is going down. 
And I've had him say to me, you know what? I became a lot calmer. So I believe if it. you don't have a garage, if your car's sitting out front, but find something where you can do it because he says pray constantly. Yeah, it's like when I can't find my glasses and I finally do after searching for 30 minutes. I said, thank you, God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now I can see again. <laughs> yeah. Sincerely mean it. Thank you, God. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yesterday, I was having a procedure done and I was getting all worked up and sweating and getting all antsy. And he goes, wow. And finally, I realized, what am I doing? So I just said, God, please be with me. And then, you know, it, I relaxed and it, I mean, I felt nothing. I thought, how ridiculous. All I had to do was pray. And I think we just have to remember that. And I always like to end my day with prayer also. It kind of gives us closure. What well, number six is the gift of hope. In 2 Peter 3, 3 through 13, Peter stated that this hope of the believer looks forward to a new heaven, a new earth, and it purifies the one who holds such a hope. Well, I think as Christians, hope is uh, one, of the, one of our glues that holds us together. What do y'all think? Any thoughts on that one? It's a great gift. Yes. It is a gift. It is. In the last problems that people, the, the problems that come with hopelessness, like the shooting yesterday in Uvalde, Texas, how hopeless that person who pulled the trigger must have been to, to take the lives of others so needlessly and unmercifully. And, you know, I, I can't imagine not having Christ in my life. You know, without him, there is no hope. Plain yeah. and simple. I agree. That was such a tragedy. And the last one is the singularity of focus upon the Lord, his return, the word of God, and growing in his grace. Peace be with you all. That's the end of Peter. Oh, what a great presentation that was. Yeah. Well, because y'all were trippers and right up there with me. <laughs> I appreciate <coughs> Could I, could I add someone to the prayer list now, please? Yes, um, ma'am. I have been pet sitting um, this precious little baby here. Um, oh. His name is Teddy. He's special needs. He takes nine medicines a day. He's blind from cataracts. He walks around in circles. So he's got some neurological issues and, and needs a lot of attention. Um, his mom... Uh, entrusted him to my care while she was in St. Kitts and Neves for a sailing trip. And she was diagnosed with COVID on Saturday and was unable to make her connecting flights to come home. So she's been holed up in her hotel room since Saturday. And until she has a negative COVID um, test outcome, she can't leave the hotel to return stateside to come home. So could we please keep Deborah Belial in our prayers? Her last name is spelled B-E-L-I-S-L-E. -E. And she lives over in Hackberry Creek, um, Las Colinas area. Um, she's a wonderful Christian woman with a huge heart. Uh, to take in this little special needs baby last year after her other two pets had passed. And um, I used to worship with her at Christ Our Savior Lutheran Church, where Jim and Pat Wenzel were also worshiping and had met them when we first moved to Texas 18 years ago. So she's a, a, a Lutheran Christian woman, and um, she needs our prayers. Got it, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Jane, uh, I don't have a clock near me. Could you give me a... About 12 noon straight up, hon. So we, okay. have, we, we have some time left if there's room for, if anybody wants to discuss more or if you've got a, whatever. Sean. You cut off there a little bit, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to do first John 316. Oh, you're gonna get John, try to do it today? Okay. This, this is my last lesson with y'all till the fall. So oh. I to get, cause I'm go back to work. And so I was trying to get mine all, all done. Okay, let's go, we got it. All right, I will probably just go through this and cut out some of the readings from the Bible. And I will name them and let y'all go back and look them up if you'd like to. That's and perfect. then if, um, we can have discussion at the end. Unless there's something someone would love to uh, add as I go. Is that all okay. right? All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. This next one is 1 John 3.16. And it reads, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This general letter does not bear the author's name but was attributed to the apostle John. The author wrote as an eyewitness of the person and ministry of Jesus. It is generally accepted that he lived the longest of the original 12 apostles, probably called to Christ in his late teens which I, I never realized that. Um, his tone was warm and intimate as he wrote to them with love and concern. Calmly and de deliberately, he recalled the fundamentals of the Christian faith and assured them of the reality of their salvation, that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 3.16, in the simplest term, means the transforming power of the Holy Spirit will lead us to give of ourselves in love, just as Jesus did. Our English term of love is so overused, it is nearly meaningless. Agape is the term of the Holy Spirit, is the term the Holy Spirit directed the author of First John to use. Its meaning is to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, and to love dearly. It is not a love of what's in it for me, but of what in me I can give to you. That, that was just so powerful to me when <coughs> I read it. And I read that over and over. And uh, hence God's love as manifested in Christ was the love of laying down his life for us and it calls us to do the same to others in the Christian family. I want to just pause there a minute. Is there any input on any of what I've read so far? Nobody? Okay. 1 John 3.17 reads, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And I was going to have someone read Deuteronomy 15, 7, but um, we can skip that. And if you want to go back and read that, that relates to 1 John 3, 17. And 1 John 3, 18 reads, Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. And I think that that's what we, we strive so much as Christians filled with the Holy Spirit so much to try to do, do in deed and in truth. And I was, the scripture that goes with that is Romans 12, 9. And 1 John chapter 3 deals with that his, how his love works its way out of our lives. And the manifestation of his love includes 1 John 3, 1 through 12, the departure from sin and pursuit of righteousness. This rich section describes in detail inner life 
and its outward results of being one who has this hope in him and purifies themselves just as he is pure. Number two is 1 John 3, 13 through 24. And it's the acceptance of life as a stewardship. Whatever we have been given is his. We own nothing, but one stewards of everything. We must discern the correct time, places, and ways to share what he has given us. This produces a confidence unknown in any other way. And again, I think Rejoice Lutheran just gives so much to so many needing organizations. This just really, and the whole church is such a stewardship. I mean, I see that from afar. And when I was visiting, it's just very, it's just so loving and obvious. And number three, sharing his love as a highest calling in this life. The theme of loving others as Christ loves is repeated many, many times. When God repeats himself this often, it's a lesson we need to be reminded of again and again. And that was one of the most important things I took from this was we just have to always be reminded. And I think getting back into the word and, um, you know, fellowship and prayer. And I'll close with, we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And that is John, 1 John 3.16, quickly. <laughs> I'd love any input if we have a minute. Yeah, it's about seven after. We've got time if anybody's got anything. Marlene? Yeah. <laughs> I think I've never read a marvelous John. job. I've never read I've, First John, I'm, but it's got, looks like it's got lots of beautiful stuff in it. I need to read it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here. I've got a, I've got post-it notes all over my house. I keep, I personally keep 3M in business, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a tendency, a habit of writing down things because I don't remember them. And I got it stuck here, this stuck to the TV tray. And I'd like to just read this to you because I think it goes along with some of what we've said today. Obeying the Lord means doing the right thing in the right way at the right time for the right reason, which is to the glory of God. Marley. <laughs> and I think that's basically what we've been saying. I don't know where it came from. And I've got written below it Psalm 3115, which re reads, My times are in thy hand. What was that again, Marlene? With the verse, the book, the chapter and number, the verse. I don't. 3115. 3115. Okay. 31, Laura? I'd like to quote Psalm 118, 24. See if you remember this one. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad, glad in it. In it. Mm -hmm. It was lovely, Jolene. Oh, great job, Jolene. We're going to miss you until fall. Well, I'll, well, I'll, miss, I'll, I'll watch the recordings. Yeah. And when I'll are be, you coming? When are you coming back into let, Texas? Let, let me end the recording so we can just talk without that, okay? Are we, are we, are we, do we want to say a prayer before I turn it off and we can just chat a minute or what? What yes. should I do, girls? I'll say a prayer. Okay. Dear Father, we praise you and thank you for this day and your word and our fellowship. Please help us to go out and serve you and use your knowledge and fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can live in your word and say your word and preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I feel like I want to go and we will. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's that, Lord.